<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to This Week in Global Health, otherwise known as TWIG. TWIG is a live internet broadcast. We do a weekly global health news roundup live on the internet. Uh, we've been having lots of technical difficulty today, so if I'm looking a little bit blurry, it's because I've got absolutely crap internet broadband, uh, so I'm hoping that I don't drop off the show completely. Anyway, uh, let's just hope it all goes well. I'm going to introduce you to the panel. Let's jump right in. Oh, just to let you know, we're going to talk about tuberculosis tonight. Right. Uh, I'll introduce myself. My name's Greg Martin. Next up, Chris Ronson. Tell us who you are and what are you going to talk about tonight? Hi, everybody. I am Chris Ronson. I'm coming to you from San Francisco, California, and I will be talking about a multitude of things within the field of tuberculosis, uh, including some of the epidemiology and uh, some facts about tuberculosis and HIV. Okay, next up, Katie. Katie, talk to us. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Jackson, and I'm coming to you from Stockholm, Sweden today, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about TB diagnostic tools. You know, it's interesting. I always ask everybody to tell us where they're from, and I never tell people where I'm from. I'm, I'm, I'm broadcasting from Dublin, by the way. Okay, next up, Sulzan. Sulzan, where are you, and what are you going to talk to us about? Hey, everybody. I'm Sulzan. I'm speaking to you from Durham, North Carolina, in the U.S., and I'll be talking about HIV and TB dual epidemic. Okay, thanks very much, Sulzan. Next up, Agnes from the CDC. Talk to us, Agnes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Agnes Navasli. Um, I'm coming from Atlanta, Georgia. I'll be talking about drug-resistant TB. Uh, Thanks, Agnes. Thanks very much. And Brian from Johns Hopkins. Brian. Yes. Hey, Brian Simpson here at Global Health Now at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore, Maryland. And I'll be telling you about uh, two of the, uh, the most uh, important global health stories of the week. Thanks very much, Brian. In fact, let's jump right in. Brian, give us your... Global Health Now stories, and I'll just remind the viewers, Global Health Now is a newsletter. It goes out daily. It's fantastic. We all read it. It's absolutely marvelous. Uh, Brian's the chief editor. Brian, give us a couple of the, the big stories this week in Global Health Now. Sure. I know you got a full show, so I'm going to make this really quick. And uh, But uh, I'll start off with good news uh, from the meningitis belt in Africa. Um, a massive project, vaccine project there, uh, getting the meningitis A vaccine to more than 215 million people has been a resounding success. Um, there are no reported uh, infections in the vaccinated populations. Uh, it's been a five-year-long project uh, from the meningitis vaccine project uh, and it was the the min min afrovac uh, vaccine from the serum institute of india and it only cost 50 cents per shot and did not require uh did not require vac uh, refrigeration so it's great news there um, and uh, the bad news is uh today i'm doing bad news good news today uh is from the u.s and i'm calling it the american plague and of course that is guns uh more than two-thirds according to new data published in the annual review of public health more than two-thirds of firearm deaths in the u.s uh, are suicides. Um, so it's not you know, not exactly what you would expect, um, although that data has been out there for a while, but it's two-thirds of the deaths from suicides. And another tragic statistic, um, uh, 89 out of every 100,000 African-American men ages 20 to 24 um, died from firearm homicides. The comparable statistic for white men of the same age is four. So 89 versus four, a horrific disparity there. Um, in terms of the suicides, uh, the one of the study authors, Garen Wintemute, says that the suicides is primarily an old white guy problem. Uh, so middle American middle-aged men uh, who are dying in firearms violence, 90% of those deaths are suicides. So tragic um, news there on, on the gun front uh, continues in the U.S. Um, and just one quick segue into the today's uh, topic, uh, tuberculosis. We had a story in uh, from the Hindu in Global Health Now yesterday uh, about the falling rate of TB, uh, TB in falling rates of TB incidence. It's not falling fast enough to reach India's goal of TB elimination or WHO goal of TB elimination by 2050. Um, there are uh, more effective de uh, deplo deployment of the strategies, such as um, uh, you know new vaccines and improved diagnostics and shortened treatment regimens would uh, could help get that rate down to more of a 10% drop per, uh, per year by 2025. Okay, thanks very much. Great news about that uh, meningitis vaccine. 
Yeah, that is terrific news. I didn't see a lot of play on that, but you know, for global health circles, I think that's great, great news, and also encouraging for other infectious diseases as well. Yeah, yeah, and of course, meningitis is a big killer, uh, and it's and it's often children that become ill, and of course, that's a huge tragedy and a massive contributor to the global burden of disease. So good to have some good news for a change. Fantastic. Yeah, Thanks, yeah exactly. Brian. I brought some good news today. <laughs> Excellent. All right, thank you okay, so much. Let's jump right in. We're going to talk about tuberculosis. Now, Bye, Brian. Uh, <coughs> as, a, as a starting point, um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what TB is. TB is caused by the mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's a bacteria, right? Now, what usually happens, we get what we call primary TB. The person becomes ill, they get an infection, usually in the lungs. And what can happen is the body, the, your immune system, can overwhelm the mycobacterium tuberculosis and create, it can create a little fibrous shell around it. And at that point, you're considered to have latent TB. In other words, you're no longer sick but the, the mycobacterium tuberculosis still lives inside that little fibrous shell. Now, about one-third of the entire world population has latent TB, right? So this it is quite ubiquitous. If you become immune compromised for some reason, so HIV or malnutrition or diabetes, something like that, that HIV can be reactivated. It can, it can, it can, it can overcome this little shell that the body's put around it, and that's what we call secondary TB. And of course, TB doesn't have to just be in the lungs. It can spread throughout the entire body. All right. So that's a little that's bit about what tuberculosis is, just so that we've got a little bit of context for the rest of the show. Oh, interestingly, Greg, uh, TB is not a new foe for mankind. In fact, there have been mum mummies from ancient Egypt which show signs of tubercular decay, showing that it's actually a quite old disease that's been plaguing mankind. Right, so this is not new, it's been around for ages. Um, you know, I was reading about something that I found quite interesting, and that is that smoking actually increases the, 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 the chances of you getting and dying of tuberculosis. In fact, about 20% of TB cases and deaths can be attributed to smoking, which is phenomenal. I mean, we talk a lot about, you know, smoking causes cancer, and of course that's terrible, but this is just another way that smoking actually is bad for you, and, and it's related to your chance of getting and dying of TB. I'm going to ask Chris. Chris, will you jump in and talk to us a little bit about the epidemiology of tuberculosis? I will indeed. Um, so just for everyone's knowledge, tuberculosis is second only to HIV as far as being the greatest killer worldwide due to a single infectious disease. I know that when we think about infectious diseases, the first one that comes to mind is HIV and AIDS. And there's actually going to be a connection between the two that we go into later in the show. Uh, to begin, in 2013, an estimated 9 million people developed tuberculosis. And of those 9 million, 1.5 of them died from the disease. Right. And and over 90% of the TB death occur in the low and middle income countries, which are already challenged with health systems. Um, so this is such a very big challenge uh, globally. And as Greg mentioned, it has a lot to do with being potentially immunocompromised. You think about, you know, in terms of immune uh, strength and stability children. So in 2013, an estimated 550,000 children worldwide became ill with tuberculosis. Uh, and of those, 80,000 of the HIV negative children died of tuberculosis. Wow, good fact. Interesting. I know, but yeah. on the on the on the on, on the good side is that the total number of people falling ill from TB is going down. Uh, the death rates have, have dropped 45 percent between 1990 and 2013, and that's very okay. encouraging. That's more good news. So we've had good news about meningitis, some good <laughs> yeah. news about TB. Yeah. Death rates have dropped yeah. by 45 percent between 1990 and 2013. We so need some good news today. We do need yeah. good. <laughs> I'm going to ask Katie. Katie, can you talk to us a little bit about TB diagnostics? Yeah. So actually, one of the really critical parts of uh, combating TB when it comes to drug resistance is uh, having a correct diagnosis. Okay, Katie might have lost her internet connection, oh. which may actually happen to me at some point tonight. But I'll just make that point, and that is that said, di diagnosis is extremely important and can be challenging in, with respect to TB, especially with respect to diagnosing uh, multidrug resistant TB. And I think, uh, Sulzan, you had one or two comments to make about that as well. Yeah, interestingly, um, so the multiple drug resistance TB and uh, TB and HIV positive people does not show up in sputum smear, which is used uh, as like you know as a standard in most countries, especially the lower middle income countries. So it does not show up as positive there. However, there's a new cartridge-based nucleic acid amplification machine called GenExpert, which can capture those smear and culture negative TB cases, which is now uh, thanks to WHO being rolled out in many countries. 
Okay, and a little interesting factoid that smear microscopy, which is basically the way uh, TB is diagnosed in many parts around the world, has actually been in place and is still being used all over the world, but it's been used since 1884. So that's a long standing tried and tested method. And of course, it's cheap because you just need a micro microscope. And, but these new, this new technology is fantastic because, of course, you can use it to distinguish regular TB from drug resistant TB, which is becoming increasingly important. Um, Sulzan, uh, we know that TB and HIV are related. Uh, there's an important relationship there. I wonder if you can jump in and talk to us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, Chris, Chris mentioned about how HIV and TB are among the top uh, infectious diseases plaguing mankind. And there's now this new phenomenon of dual epidemics, which is happening because of high rate of co-infection of TB and HIV. In fact, people living with HIV are 26 to 31 times more likely to become sick with TB. Uh, in fact, at least a third of the people are living with HIV worldwide in 2013 uh, were infected with TB, leading 25% of the death uh, with, uh, within people with HIV globally. Yeah, and that's that's really, oh my god, that's quite a big number. And when you talk about stigma, TB has always been associated with stigma of poverty. However, add to it stigma of HIV, now that's a stigma which is hampering global efforts to thwart this whole TB-HIV co-epidemic. Okay, I'll move forward with some of the. Oh, okay. I can move forward with some of the positives. So we're talking about uh, everything between like the co-infections and the etiology and pathophysiology of tuberculosis. Let's go into treatment options. Uh, an estimated 37 million lives were saved through tuberculosis diagnostics and treatment between 2013. I'm sorry, 2000 and 2013. And something good to note too is that article that Brian mentioned in Global Health Now. We'll also have the link to it available on our show notes. Is an excellent article that sort of goes into both some of the treatment methods that have been used as well is uh, how we need to continue treating and addressing tuberculosis in large populations. I'm going to turn it over to Katie for a couple of facts. So actually, some countries are experiencing a major decline in cases. Brazil and China, for example, have shown a sustained decline, which is really good news. And in 2013, there were an estimated 1.1 new million new cases of TB amongst people living with HIV. And of those cases, 78% were living in Africa. Um, something to keep in mind is that without treatment, TB, tuberculosis mortality rates are incredibly high. 70% of smear positive people infected with tuberculosis will die within 10 years. And I believe that is of infection, not of diagnosis, obviously, because if it's latent, you don't know how long you've had it. Um, and on that note, too, tuberculosis does continue to be a growing challenge for people everywhere in combating it because of its ability to... Um, mutate. And so I'm going to have Agnes speak to you guys a little bit on drug-resistant tuberculosis and the different variations of that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that we've made such amazing uh, progress towards uh, combating death from TB, but we've had to redo with a very dangerous bottleneck, and that's drug-resistant TB. Uh, Global in 2013, an estimated 480,000 people developed mild drug-resistant drug TB, and the primary cause of MDR-TB is poor adherence to treatment or use of uh, poor quality drugs. Uh, and uh, both these causes can be uh, mitigated on if we only could do enough uh, health education uh, within the, pet, the patient that are being treated. Oh my god, that's, that's yeah, so the, the whole, the fact that the TB requires such a long line of treatment and people default the treatment has is now giving rise to this multi-drug resistant TB and ex, um, extensively drug resistant TB. Now, what is MDR-TB? Um, MDR-TB or multiple drug resistant TB is a form of tuberculosis caused by bacteria which do not respond at all to the isoniazid or rifampicin, the two most powerful first line drugs which are used to address TB. Um. And what we also need to emphasize is that together, India and China account for 50% of, of MDR-TB cases. Um, and these are countries with such very heavy populations. And that it's something that needs to be put at the forefront of efforts that are fighting uh, tuberculosis infection globally. That is a shocking number. Oh my god, Agnes. I mean, 50% of MDR-TB cases yeah. in India and China alone. Wow, wow. So. Yeah. Yeah. Treatment for MDR-TB is not always available, and it's the reason it's you know you see rise of these drug-resistant strains is because this long treatment it requires up to two years of treatment, and these drugs are also very expensive, and especially once you get the MDR-TB, you're looking at really expensive drugs, and that's a big public health issue. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Definitely. we have a bigger challenge. Uh, sorry, I was saying that we have a bigger <laughs> challenge to uh, more drug res uh, resistant TB. We have extensively drug resistant TB, and that is really a terrible situation. It means the person is not responding to most of the drugs that are available for TB. Uh, in most VR cases, extensive, uh, extensive drug resistant TB can occur. Uh, in these cases, the, um, the disease responds to even fewer other medicines, including the most effective second line TB drugs. And, and the, again, this keeps on um, compromising the progress we are trying to achieve. So uh, TB programs. Agnes, I have a question. So does that mean the extensively drug resistant TB does not respond to any TB drugs? So it does not respond to second line drugs as well? Uh, to most of them, uh, and I think that's the biggest challenge. Uh, so what is happening is that we we picked up a couple of cases um, in in the recent past, and and these people are not responding to any of the drugs that were available for B. Uh, it has been such a big challenge and something that needs to be addressed uh, because it's picking up. Um, yeah. Uh, it, uh, and already we have big cases in China and India for MDR, so we could see more of, uh, probably we might be able to see more of X, XDR cases coming up. Yeah, it's definitely something that needs to be addressed when it comes to like access to medicines and developing new medicines. Um, mm. I know that the MDR and the XDR tuberculosis are considered neglected diseases at this point because there hasn't been a lot of research done. Uh, that has given results as to new medications to treat these cases because they are so resistant to traditional treatment lines. Um, one thing that I was just thinking too is going back to Agnes's fact about how together China and India account for 50% of MDR tuberculosis cases. Greg also made that point about smoking um, sort of contributing to your risk of developing tuberculosis and I know that India and China have some of the highest smoking rates so if anybody watching whether you're watching live or you're watching in the future please shoot us an email and let us know if you know of any research that maybe we can cite or quote or put on the website that maybe shows a correlation between the tuberculosis rates and the smoking rates very directly um, just to move forward a little bit, for anybody who's interested in working in the tuberculosis landscape, there are a number of big and smaller named uh, organizations that you can work through in both you know, vaccine development as well as advocacy, treatment, and just to name a few, we've got the Stop TB Partnership, ARIS, we've got GFATM, Unitaid, the TB Alliance, um, of course, the Gates Foundation, Clinton Health Access Initiative, the WHO, which is where we got a lot of our facts today, the CDC, Operation 